My name is Dennis Benjamin Del Torre, as he said. Um, I'm a son, a brother, a father, a grandfather, a spouse, a retired landscaper, gardener, a poet, and an artist. That's a brief, brief description because all of us are much more than we think we are. Uh, there, there's a beginning and a middle. The end is somewhere down the road. So keep moving before the end gets you. So I've never talked in public much, so I, I need these notes. I hope that's okay. I spend most of my time in the shop or around the house, and I'm not familiar with public speaking, but I'm going to give it my, my all. I've chosen not to do a, a slideshow because that can be, I find, if you've ever been to uh, talks, slides can be boring and um, it can cause a lot of impatience. So, I wanted to start out by saying a Marshall McLuhan quote. I believed, I've always believed this and I worked uh, most of my artistic career around this um, quote. It keeps me sane, happy and focused. Mm -hmm. Art is anything you can get away with. And I like the humor in it as well. <laughs> and then my second quote is something I wrote saying, swirling in the amnesia of history has defined my art. Now I'll get around to that in a further down the road. So thank you for coming one and all. A short history. I started in high school. I don't remember much about elementary school except I had a perfect attendance record in grade three until the day before getting out and getting a certificate from the teacher I got sick. Couldn't make it and got admoni admonished by the teacher. I started in high school to make doodles of swirling colors, swooping curves, emerging faces and shapes much in the line of Juan Miro, the great Spanish painter and sculptor. I absolutely fell in love with his squiggles, dots, and color signatures. Other great influences included Picasso, Matisse, Jackson Pollock, Alexander Calder, Alex Colville, Dali, Kandinsky, Paul Klee, and Chagall. There's uh, many more, of course, but these come to mind as the most prominent and enduring. By the time I graduated high school and continued on to Humber Community College in Toronto, I had taken on more artistic pursuits such as a huge interest in music, lyrics, and performance, mostly due to the Beatles, of course, <laughs> the Rolling Stones, and the Blues. And there was Joni Mitchell, Gordon Lightfoot, Leonard Cohen, and then all the poets from America and beyond, such as Allen Ginsberg, Pablo Neruda, Al Purdy, with whom I studied in Banff at the School of Fine Arts, or the School of Fine Farts, as we used to call it. <laughs> Mil Milton Acorn, Alden Olin, Gwendolyn McEwen, P.K. Page, Margaret Atwood, etc., etc. But by 1974 or so, in the small magazines, Poetry and Lit, in the Vancouver Library, I discovered one Charles Bukowski. It took some getting used to, so he was so different from all the rest, so raw, so honest, straight ahead, and crazy and lazy and drunk and foolish. There was no pretense, no holding back, no embellishment. Anyway, long story short, I ended up going to his Vancouver reading in 1977 at the Western Front. I was so moved by him that I started to spread the word and got some friends together to attend the showing of the video at the Western Front only to discover it had been lost or stolen. The manager at the front was at a, a loss to say for what to say and I was hugely disappointed. At that point I wrote to Bukowski and asked him to come back and in October 1979 Forty years ago, I arranged for him to give another reading in Vancouver at a hall on East Hastings with 650 people in attendance for a poet. I went to L.A. to his last public reading the next year, and we remained in touch after that. He died in 1994. By this time, I had formed my own landscaping and gardening business had established a workshop come studio in the Marpole District of Vancouver. 
So now I began to collect things, many and all things, and wood for sculpting. Uh, all of this was supported and bolstered by a business which allowed me to be outside all the time and to move about all over the city and the lower mainland and to find objects that were cast aside, thrown out, run over, found on the shores of the Fraser River and on the shores of Salt Spring or Savory or Texada or Denman or Hornby or Qualicum. All this plenitude had to have expression and slowly, bit by bit, I started carving and sculpting, bought a lathe and did some turning and after we moved to Marpole in 1987, I began to really undertake the new forms of my art that still form the backbone of what I do today. Today it's sculpture, assemblage and collage I mostly do. One other important part of this history is to have worked on the restoration of the Natobi Memorial Garden as part of the uh, Asian Center at UBC. By 1990, it had fallen into disrepair and the Department of Landscape Architecture at UBC had chosen a master Japanese traditional garden, uh, a master of Japanese traditional gardens, Shunmyo Masano of Yokohama, to undertake its repair. Included was a 400-year-old national treasure landscaping team from Kyoto, led by Mr. Sano, Sunichi Sano, with whom I became friends and, and with went to Kyoto, who I became friends with and went to Kyoto, to Kyoto to work with him and his crew for two months in 1994 and did subsequent work with him and Masano in Ottawa on another garden for the go Government of Canada on the rooftop of the administration building of the Museum of Civilization. At that time it was called the Museum of Man, but I think they've changed the name now to the Museum of Civilization. Mm -hmm. The garden's still there. We used all local materials from the surrounding Ottawa region. Was the rooftop garden what year? Pardon me? What year was that the rooftop garden? It was built in 1995. I also planted cherry trees for uh, Mr. Sano, whose father was a cherry tree expert and developed various uh, cultivars. And we, did, we traveled throughout the United States in 1994 as well, planting cherry trees in uh, High Point, North Carolina, Cincinnati, Ohio, and uh, Plymouth, Massachusetts. They were all Japanese subsidiary companies that requested these cherry trees, and we got them in from Oregon by train and we planted them throughout the, these um, companies' uh, um, land area. Uh, during this time, sorry, where was I? Okay, the administrate. During this time, I did several shows in Vancouver with a painter friend of mine, Elizabeth McLaren, and continued collecting on our trips to Mexico, Hawaii, the Bahamas, Cannon Beach, Oregon, and of course, the Gulf Islands. I also had a solo show at the Uni Unity Church in Vancouver, curated by another artist friend, Shirley Weeb. My art has been a response to climate change. This is what I feel about it anyway. My art has been a response to climate change, a response to wastefulness, a response to indulgence, a response to the irresponsibility of humans as they trash this planet their home and nesting ground. I try to put things back in order, give materials found and saved a new life, saving them from the swirling mass of the amnesia that history seems to bequeath on humans. It seems that as a species, we are reluctant to look back and recall the beauty and gift that abundance <coughs> has given us. Instead, we pretend and accept the meager attributes of today's world and squeeze this out of the tiny tube of lies and denials that pisses on reality. So, from an eager student who never missed a day of school to a, 
to a champion athlete, I skipped over that beat, that, that, <laughs> that bit, to the senior literary prize in high school, to a party hardy skier and hippie in Banff, to a three month canoe trip through, uh, through BC, to driving a cab in Vancouver, then starting a landscaping and uh, gardening company in Vancouver, to the recent move to the Cowichan Valley, Art has always been the backbone of existence for me because of its curative power, because of its ability to provide escape, relief, sustenance, transforming the material into the spiritual. I hope this intro has helped you to see who and what I am, if just a tiny helping of information and background. I'd like to go on and deconstruct the pieces that I brought. I brought several pieces with us, with me today, and um, um, and the ideas they represent. And, and then I thought, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And then I would like to finish when we're when we're done with the the overview of the pieces and the questions. I'd like to finish with a poem by Mr. Bukowski that relates. I think to all artists and what art is, what it means to all of us and um, how we get there and what we should be doing to get there in the end. So that's the introduction. Thank you. So if you saw my piece out there, it's, it's um, it's an, a piece of assemblage, if it's a piece of a piece here, a piece there, what is it? A piece of wa a wood, a piece of bone, a piece of feather, and how I put them together. And how I put that one together was just, I, we were on Savory about last year or the year before, and uh, most of it was done there, I brought, and then I bring it home. And sometimes I put um, pieces aside for years at a time. Um, I just sold a piece last year at the CVAC show, the Cowichan Valley Arts Council show, of, uh, it was called Oddballs, and it was a, a piece about this big, and it was a uh, cross-hatch thing, and it had balls in each one of them that I had collected over 25 years. And I never really had, I had all the balls, and I had the, the cross-hatch thing for years and years and years, and I knew what exactly what I wanted to do with it, and I thought, well, the CVAC show is coming up. I got to do something to put it, I got to put something in the show. So I finally, after about 20 years, laid it down and over a three week period assembled all the balls and uh, called it Odd Balls. And <laughs> it, it, believe it or not, it sold to a gentleman named Keith I with dot I, large I dot ball. <laughs> Uh, Keith lived on, lived in the College and Valley, and then he's moved to, uh, he's moved to Nanaimo now, and he's an inventor, but he thought it was, he thought it was, and he's got it hanging in his living room, and it draws a lot of comments. Uh, Keith Eyeball bought oddballs. <laughs> so that was that was hilarious. Uh, so I'm in, I'm in the Cowichan Valley now and uh, I volunteer at, the, at CVAC and, and contribute to their, we're building a brand, we just finished renovating the gallery there. We all hope that you can come by someday in Duncan. And uh, they've done a beautiful job and we've joined the two galleries. There was two separate galleries and we've joined them up now. And uh, we've brightened it up, we've taken all the, all the dark wood off the walls and painted it an, an off-white and it looks beautiful. Anyway, um, I'd like to show you these three pieces I brought and, and how they came about. This one is called uh, Beach Blues and it's an assemblage as you can see. So what I'll do is Lou and I will be on, this is Lou, my, my dear wife, and we'll often, we went up to Savory for how many, 10 years? Mm -hmm. We have stopped going now because the rent got too expensive, but... <laughs> um, How long have you been married? Uh, 40 years. 40? 
<laughs> I was there for it all. <laughs> we actually met just before the Bukowski reading in 79. She helped, she helped me put up posters for, the, for that. And um, so I would go about and I'd collect anything that looked, that had color, that had any kind of, and it wasn't aimed at this particular piece, but there would be several, I would have maybe several hundred uh, pieces laid out and we w I would set up a table on some s saw horses and while we were there I'd start working and I'd start gluing and cutting and whatever was appropriate, whatever needed to be done. Uh, in that piece, I just had the one piece of cedar and started putting things in this piece. I love collecting old plywood as well. Sometimes it's colorful and um, it has a lot of texture and uh, a, a certain patina to it that I like. And um, that's, that's how that one came about. Now this one has a very... What, what do you call the one that you just had there? The one I just put down? Yeah. Beach Blues. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Now this is another, another uh, interesting story, I think. This one's called, well, as you can see what it's called. <laughs> and I found this, you know, it's one of these, I don't know, Look, what do you call that stuff, Dorian? Uh, plastic. Oh, chloroplast? Well, anyway, you know, those, you've seen lots of these signs, election time, the, the thing. Anyway, this was the, this was the uh, beaten up sign of a restaurant. And the, uh, it was laying in the ditch in East Vancouver, uh, where I'd had one of my customers, and I saw the R-A-N-T, -R that was all that was left. So I took it home and I thought, well, that's an interesting thing. But when you think of a rant, you, ha you think of a, a jagged, uh, um, barbed thing. So that's where I came up with the idea of putting all this wire and uh, mounting in that. I think it's quite effective. Rant. When yeah. When you think of rant, it's, it's like people rant. Like, I think they have it in our group, don't they have roses and rants? Or politicians. politicians. Yes. I wanted to get that jaggedness and, and edginess to it, and that's what I came up with. And then I thought all the lines work together, and uh, so I hope you like that. And this was a... Uh, This was a, a piece of concrete I found. Just, um, and this is a cabinet drawer which was served as the mount for it. I don't know, they just seemed to go together. And then I added these uh, metal eye things and this, whatever that is, and painted that gold. And I call this one the guy in the closet, outer space oh, yeah. ambassador. <laughs> I like to do a lot of uh, figures. I like to do a lot of um, uh, faces. And uh, I don't know why. I think it's because I kind of think of theater. I think of masks a lot. I think of makeup. I think of who's going to come out of the closet. Who's going to come out of the doorway next in the theater. So a lot of my pieces I think of theatrical impressions and movies and science fiction like this could be a, a an easily created <laughs> science fiction person so okay. rather than do slides I thought oh. why don't I just bring a couple of the smaller pieces with me and since we only had to take the ferry it's not a big deal maybe so maybe, maybe you're right. I guess I should have brought more, but there's more time for questions, I guess. So uh, I had a solo show at the Cowich and uh, Valley Art Gallery there, the Portals, in Ju May and June. And I'm going to hopefully, pardon me? No, it was, it was earlier this year. How many pieces? 33. 33? Sold 33, 33, yeah. We sold 10. Oh, and yes, we sold 10. Yeah. Which was an, apparently which the best opening they'd ever had. 
<laughs> for sales, anyway. I don't, I don't know about quality, but for sales. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. 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 So you um, left out, to, uh, well, I have several things. I'm, I'm joining the rant until I'm thinking about rape and uh, us getting to enjoy the, what you're bringing and bringing into yourself and telling your own story. And so what I noticed is I'm uh, one that's interested in intensity, and you left out the one about the athleticism, although your work involves a lot of... Yeah, okay, I was a, a strain, I think I was a unusual combination. Uh, when I was a kid, I loved sports. I played everything. Lacrosse, baseball, hockey, football, into high school, basketball, track and field. And I was a Canadian junior champion in Javelin in 1967. Wow. That's <laughs> under 20. I went to the tri... And well, that was centennial year, so I went to the uh, Ottawa three countries, the three founding countries, or the two founding countries, England and France and Canada, and we had a meet in Ottawa. I finished third in that. And I also won Athlete of the Year in, in high school, uh, my last, second last year for the school, but I also um, was uh, the top quarterback in Toronto and was going to go to the United States to uh, Kent. I would have been in my graduating year I think, or second, it doesn't matter what, what year it was, I would have been in, at Kent State when the students got shot in 1970 by the militia. But fate intervened. I got tackled on the second last game of the year and shattered my uh, right knee, medial collateral anterior cruciate ligament, and the, all the meniscus was wrecked. And in those days, they used to s slice you wide open. And of course, I never paid much attention to the doctor's orders and I had a, a cast on, they used to put a cast on from your ankle to your thigh. And uh, we used to do a lot of hunting in those days. And my brother said, ah, you're all right, you come hunting with us. You just stand in the field with a shotgun, we'll share, scare the rabbits to you. <laughs> and we used to hunt rabbits in, outside of Toronto and pheasant. So I'm standing on this patch of ice and of course I <laughs> slip and shattered the cast. And uh, I didn't, the gun didn't go off, I was okay. <laughs> but, um, but I shattered the cast and I wrecked my, the operation and I had to have a second operation. So that put an end to my, uh, my hopes of ever getting, ever, ever getting to the major football leagues or at that I was also wanted to go to the Olympics and Javelin, but that put an end to that. So then I was kind of despondent and that's how I ended up in Banff being a hippie skier. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I was on the UIC racing team <laughs> and that's where I met Brent and, and we went on this three month canoe trip together and we did a lot, I did a lot of uh, art on that as well. We used to do, uh, uh, out of the, we went up to Utsuk Lake and I used to do installations. I would gather sticks and leave them in the, put them in the sand and they looked like figures. Or, and uh, I should have photographed them, but I didn't. In those Bahamas. days, I just like to leave it behind. Bahamas, yes, in the Bahamas, I did, I did an a installation in the Bahamas. I was shocked when I got to, we had some friends in the Bahamas. And uh, I was shocked to see how much debris there was on the, on the uh, plastic and nets and, and floats and all this, all this garbage from the, from the uh, Caribbean washed up on the beaches, so I thought, well, I might as well do something with it, and I would go out and find all these shoes, mm -hmm. and I put them on, I nailed them to this big log that was there, and I called it uh, On the Road to Nowhere. <laughs> and then apparently, over the years, people have added to it. <laughs> it's, I know, it was called uh, We're on the Road to Nowhere, out of that old Talking Head song. So, and apparently people loved it and they added to it over the years because we never went. It was in Freeport. There's a, a shoe tree in the north of the island, way up north. Pardon me? Uh, same thing. It's a shoe tree that started the same way. Yeah? So on, uh, I think the hikers up there would kind of toss their shoes out when they got to this place and start putting them on the tree and then everyone that came by would stick another shoe on. It is just covered from top to bottom with shoes. 
<laughs> well, we did a piece like that. On, we, her and I did a piece like that on Savory. We found on Savory you'll find all this rope cast off from from uh, sailboats and tugs and whatnot and barges. And we started. Uh, there was a dead tree uh, not too far from uh, Indian Point and that leans out over the beach. So her and I were walking down there one day and I said, I had all this rope. I said, why don't we start an installation on this and that encouraged people to add to it. So we started wrapping all the branches and hanging, hanging uh, rope and bric-a-brac that we would find, but mostly rope. And we would, sometimes we'd wrap a branch or sometimes we'd wrap it and let it droop off. And so I've got lots of pictures of it. But uh, people over the years have added to it and it's getting bigger and bigger. And it's a good way to get everything off the beach in one place. Eventually, you know, and eventually we could just set it on fire. <laughs> and burn it down. You said you have uh, things you've collected over the years, so I wonder what must your workshop or your garage look like? Oh, I've probably got... How do you organize it? I've probably got enough work to keep me dizzy till I bury me. Mm -hmm. Without any... Like, I could probably... Be, and I need to do more work. I'm quite a lazy person sometimes. And, um, do you have cherry trees? Cherry trees? I have one cherry tree, but the deer eats it all the time. So now I've had to wrap it up with wire. But uh, is there any, anything else? Uh, any other questions? Can you spell the name of the poet that you're going to read? Thank you. Why don't we read that now? And it'll give us. <laughs> I think you'll like this. It's uh, from a from a book of his called "Sifting Through the Madness for the Word, the Line, the Way." Does anyone here know Bukowski? By the way, a few people. So I, I, I love this poem because I think it applies to all artists, people who want to be try to be artists or or think about it or collect things or paint, draw. It doesn't matter what. Make films. I think this is an, an excellent, so just, he, it's called, so you want to be a writer. So just say, you could substitute, you want to be a poet, you want to be a, a video guy, you want to make movies, whatever. If it doesn't come bursting out of you, in spite of everything, don't do it. Unless it comes unasked out of your heart and your mind and your mouth and your gut, don't do it. <clears throat> If you have to sit for hours staring at your computer screen or hunched over your typewriter searching for words, don't do it. If you're doing it for money or fame, don't do it. If you're doing it because you want women in your bed, don't do it. If you have to sit there and rewrite it again and again, don't do it. If it's hard work, just thinking about doing it, don't do it. <laughs> if you're trying to write like somebody else, forget about it. If you have to wait for it to roar out of you, then wait patiently. If it never does roar out of you, do something else. If you first have to read it to your wife, or your girlfriend, or your boyfriend, or your parents, or to anybody at all, you're not ready. <clears throat> don't be like so many writers. Don't be like so many thousands of people who call themselves writers. Don't be dull and boring and pretentious. Don't be consumed with self-love. <clears throat> The libraries of the world have yawned themselves to sleep over your kind. Don't add to that. <laughs> Don't do it. Unless it comes out of, your, out of your soul like a rocket. Unless being still would drive you to madness or suicide or, mur or murder. Don't do it. <laughs> Unless the sun inside you is burning your gut, don't do it. When it is truly time, and if you have been chosen, it will do it by itself, and it will keep on doing it until you die or it dies in you. 
There is, <clears throat> there is no other way, and there never was. So that's, uh, that's how I feel about art. I think that poem sums it up beautifully. Um, do something else, you know? If it doesn't come, doesn't come to you, that's okay. Do whatever you have to do. Um, how are we doing? Great. Great. Good. We're doing good. Any other questions, oh, maybe? When you were talking about your javelin, I remember when you went to the senior, was it the senior games? Last year. Was it last year and you... you the BC you? over 55 games? Yeah, yeah, so you know, stop and you can I tried to do that, but I couldn't run any. I have to, you have to run to throw a javelin. Yeah. And I can barely w w jog anymore from here to that door. It was in your heart to try. I try. I was gonna. I was gonna stand still, but then I thought, no, I'll just do bocce instead. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because I'm a, I'm a from Italian background, so uh, bocce was all very familiar to me, and it's a lot easier on the knees. <laughs> Is bocce Italian game. Uh, yeah, it's called, uh, what's it called in France? Boule. Yeah, it's boule in France, it's a bocce in Italian, it's, I guess you could say lawn bowling in English, but it, lawn bowling's a bit different because the ball has a cant to it which makes it curve a little bit. Whereas bocce is just a straight ball yeah, and we... I learned it, I played it. <laughs> beaches and P.E.I. this summer, I'm addicted. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Get it going Whoa. here. <laughs> um, Party's getting started. I'm thinking it, uh, there's a lot of art in Napa and Sonoma. And one of the, uh, I think it's the Hess Gallery up in the Hill of Swiss Gallery, has a typewriter which continuously has flames coming out of it. Yeah. <laughs> Great. And uh, there's also an interesting book that I've seen, maybe it was in the MoMA Gallery, that's really wonderful called Art is the Highest Form of Hope. That's right. Oh, yes. Which is a bunch of quotes of artists. And I think that's another Marshall McLuhan one. Because I, I uh, was reading, I got all his uh, quotes up and he had quite a few interesting ones. And I don't know if that was, but I thought, I've, I've heard that one as well. I recommend it, so I'll try and recommend it to the bookstore here to get it because people might enjoy it. And what I've done is to go through and rewrite every one, or at least the ones, to take it to the next level. So in terms of passion and intensity and what you've been giving is, what is it that you thought about saying here that you said, oh, I don't know that I'm gonna push the envelope or say that, I'm inviting you, or what I often say, say something you wouldn't normally say at a cocktail party, or in terms of other things when your art, you know, like I was a sailboat racer, or was on the cross country championship team in the state of Washington, and one of the things in sailboat racing is, um, Thing about if you're not over early once in a while, you're not going for the start. You know, there are these sort of things that live in us, and I'm really enjoying who you are and what you're giving us today. And I'm just fishing. I have a commercial fishing boat in the Bering Sea, and I, I like to catch things. And I'm be seeing if there's anything else that might come out of you while you're here with us. Oh, you, you mean? <laughs> Keep talking. <laughs> I was going to say, if you. Oh, thank you. I should have had this in the first place. I got quite dry. I was just going to say, if anything ends up in your net that you don't want, send it to me. <laughs> there, that's a good one. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do, you, I was, do you get much plastic in your nets these up days? In the Bering Sea, there's almost no bycatch. It's really quite a pure fishery, as opposed to some other areas. So, I mean, we're fishing for sockeye, and we get a little bit of some other kinds of salmon. And one time I did get a 375 pound salmon shark, which was a total shock. But wow. in terms of drift, um, in the early 80s, there were still some glass floats from Japan on the beach, but they're all gone. And so the, the, the beach is really amazingly clean up there. I was, ashamed, I was amazed at the debris that was on the beaches in Mexico and the Yucatan. Mm. We went down to, uh, Bel not Belize, uh, Beach. No, the one right at the, by the border of uh, uh, Belize. Baloom, is it? Tulum. Tulum. We went to Tulum and there was a, a huge uh, sand embankment and it was pristine, looked pristine. 
and you, would st you could stick your hand in and pull the sand and it would cascade down and would reveal tires, nets, toothbrushes, hypodermics, shoes, everything, every, every conceivable. So I think we've got a huge thing in our hand. I mean, I'm trying to recycle it in my way, but uh, the plastic problem is, to me, is very, very serious. And I hope we help. I've heard of chemists that are coming up with bacteria that'll eat plastic. There's that kid from Denmark who's invented a big thing to go out into the Pacific patch and try and uh, pick it all up. How we recycle it, I don't know. How we... Ron? Um, you, um, with your piece that you have in the Snap Exhibition Totem? Pardon me? With the piece, the work that you had in the Snap Exhibition, yeah. the piece Totem? Yes. Um, we we uh, had an art night last night and there was a lot of discussion about um, uh, the various cultures that it seems to touch. Actually, I think there was about four or five different cultures that the piece associated with or people thought that. For yourself, did you have, you obviously calling it totem, but did you have, as you collected that and put that together, you know, did you have a, any kind of cultural associations yourself that you thought about? Or did you leave it ambiguous? Can you just talk about that a, a little bit? Oh, you mean like cultural appropriation? No, no? I don't think that the, in terms of the sense of cultural appro appropriation, you know, that wasn't really brought up with regards to your piece, but is, you know, does it have a Polynesian, for example, uh, you know, nature? Does it, does it have a First Nations nature? Does it look like, you know, a, you know objects from other, from other places? Like what, what kind of, you know, image were you trying to piece together? Oh, um, I see what you're saying. Well, I, I, since I've seen so many living here in Vancouver and on the West Coast for well over 40 years, uh, of course I had a lot of, seen a lot of poles, a lot of totems. I actually was on Queen Charlotte, Queen Charlotte's uh, Haida Gwaii in 76. Uh, and you know who was on the beach carving the first pole that was to be lifted in Skidigat and over 90 years was Bill Reed. Uh, and we drove by Bill Reed every day. I lived, uh, lived on um, Haida Gwaii in Queen Charlotte City for, from May of 76 until September. And Bill Reed was carving the pole. I didn't know who he was. Nobody knew who he was at that time. It's 1976. But there was Bill Reed on, with a huge cedar pole carving the first pole that was going to be raised in Skidigat and was it over 90 years. Uh, late 1880s, I guess, and here was, and we used to stop by, and you know, Bill would read was there, and I mean, this was such a fantastic thing, and instigated my I, uh, carving. Uh, one gave me some in, impetus to carve as well, but to see that pole, and then we saw the old poles in Skidigat and Masset, so that was the beginning of all these, seeing all this native art, and then when I did the piece, did I directly attribute it to that? No, I just knew that I'd seen a lot of poles, and I, it probably was in my very being, all the native art, that have, indigenous art that I've seen up and down the coast, whether it's Haida, whether it's Haida or whether it's uh, Musqueam, or whether it's here in, Cow in Cowichan. Uh, so when I did it, I was just feeling, oh, this looks like a totem, like it's, it came as a big surprise and it just revealed itself uh, piece by piece. And, uh, but I didn't, I didn't want to copy them, I didn't want to make the, 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 what do you call the, you know, the ovals and all that. I just did what I thought was my totem for, for myself. Yeah, I, I thought it looked quite Polynesian, actually. I, I was curious. Yeah, that was my own when I first saw the piece. Uh, you know, in, in nature, it had to me it had that, which is another coast culture. Yeah. Oh, well, we've been to Hawaii too and seen a lot of the uh, Polynesian uh, art there. But I, I, it was just a response to uh, totems in general, and I, I was just so delighted that it came out that way. And, uh, um, so that was just by accident, I guess. Like a lot of my pieces just come about by accident. I'll start them, leave them scattered all over the shop, 
sometimes weeks, sometimes months, years go by before I get back to them and do them seven, eight times at a time. Do you write yourself? Pardon? Do you write yourself? Uh, not so much anymore. I used to. I, I, was a, I used to publish poetry in the early Vancouver days. I noticed one of your sponsors is Myrna Fertig. Mona. Yes. Oh, Mona. Do you know Mo is Mona here? Is she? She's yeah. not here right now. She was at the opening. Yeah. yeah. Oh, too bad because I used to go to. She ran a. Um, she ran a place in Vancouver in down in the in Gastown called a literary storefront, mm -hmm. and she used to give readings there. And she brought people in. Uh, one time she brought Al Purdy in, and um, I can't remember all the people. Bill Bissett. That, Bill Bissett. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Mona herself was a writer, so I don't know, maybe she still is. She is, yeah. She writes herself and she has Mother Tongue uh, publishing. Uh, Mother Tongue. Mm -hmm. Out of here, she did the whole series of uh, Unknown Artists. It's a wonderful series of books. Uh, I don't know if you've seen them, but as well as published. They publish several several books a year, at least. Yeah. She and her husband. Mm -hmm. Peter. Yeah. I have a question. So when you were deciding to submit to uh, this uh, competition, did you have a few pieces that you considered to, to pick, or was it hard to decide which one, or did that just happen? I, to be honest with you, I didn't think I had a chance to get into this one. Mm -hmm. And at the last day the, day, the day before the closing, I think I sent it in, the digital image, and it was it. It was you were allowed up to three submissions, I think. Yes. I thought, well, I thought this is my best piece that I, I felt it was my best piece out among many others, and I thought, and I didn't know the exact criteria what the judges were looking for or what they were going to pick. So I thought, well, I'll take a chance, and I, I was just, I was happily shocked <laughs> when uh, it, in July it, they said your piece has been chosen. And then they told me how many had been submitted and how many artists, and I was like flabbergasted. Because I was never, even though I'm 70, over 70 years old, I never considered doing this as a full-time, you know, I was, I was a gardener and landscaper for 40 years. And uh, this was always a byproduct of finding all these things. And I loved doing it, and I never, never thought of doing that as, or advancing it as my main thing. So this is, moving to Cowichan has been a, kind of like a, an opening, a, a flowering, if you will, for me. Because now I don't have to do any more landscaping. <laughs> <laughs> and art has become, has become the number one thing to do. In, uh, and I don't like using the word retirement. Just the next, the next thing, the next thing. How are you influencing young people? Pardon me? How are you influencing young people, the coming generation? Well, um, I don't know if I am. <laughs> but that's kind of the hint, right? Like, I mean, I'm curious what you think is happening and how things are evolving. And of course, it seems like all of us are appreciating something, some values you have in you, how humble you are, how hard you're working for what you're getting. I mean, it's something really important that maybe needs to get some energy put into it. So I'm wondering if you're teaching or helping people to see things that they might not be able to see? Uh, no, just, it, I guess the only way I'm doing that is by creating mm -hmm. these things and, and having the show I had in June and I hope to have another one next year. And volunteering. Pardon? The volunteering that you do. Is yes. I, yeah, I volunteer at, at, uh, in the galleries at, in, um, in Duncan. But could I add to that? Like, like you, uh, because that was sort of my question was, um, you got a lot of education in, in art, right? And like at an early age, like Robert Bateman became a, high, a teacher because like that would support himself and through going with art. But uh, from your bio, if I got it right, you went to like different art schools studying in uh, Albert, he was a mentor, and that was still in your, like, 20s? Yes. So, okay, but then at some point you had to start thinking of how am I going to support myself, right? That's right. 
And <laughs> so you, I couldn't stay on the UIC skiing team forever. <laughs> yeah. So then you thought, oh, I'll be a landscaper. Yeah. That, that's how it went. Well, my first job in Banff was uh, picking stones up off the golf course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, even in, in your times, in Robert Bateman's and lots of people you mentioned, the music world everywhere, the art world, there wasn't so much compared to now for young people. I mean, that's, that's a huge population and a lot of art, like the idea of supporting yourself for people that go on to university or art college or whatever, like that thing of still, how are you going to have a livelihood with, with it? So. Well, it's, uh I remember reading a quote, I think it was by Brendan Behan, he said, uh, why did you quit writing poetry? He said, I found easier ways to be poor. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, when you started off, you got me right away because you talked about climate change and your whole thing on plastics and Look what we're, even Friday there's going to be a huge all over the world youth movement about climate change. So. Ah, that's great. I'm really glad to see that. Uh, Greta Thunberg, the way she blasted, the, blast, she deserves to blast us. All the kids deserve to blast us. We did not do well. We could have done a lot better and I mean I was just reading an article in the, about the Central Valley in California being a landscaper that people may not know, but the land there has sunk eight meters. So the it's been why? Because we've drawn all the water out from under the Central Valley yeah. aquifer. Yeah. Uh, was that necessary? I don't know. I think if you're going to think about four or five or six hundred years from now, you wouldn't do that to your, <laughs> your, the people that are coming after you. You know? You wouldn't chop, you wouldn't cut all the old growth down on, on, the, on Vancouver Island to satisfy your need now, you would think about three or four hundred years from now. What are my and what are my children's 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 going to need? You know, they're going to need lots of oxygen, and those trees supply oxygen. Why? Are, and there's none of them left in the world. Why would you cut them down? I don't. I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense to me. And we and we just found out this this year that Cowichan Valley owns six mountains around uh, around Duncan. Yeah. And, and um, they used to cut down trees every year and make a million dollars for the treasury in, in North Cowichan. But, but, you know, the people didn't know that we owned, the community owned those trees. They're not privately, they weren't owned by Weyerhaeuser or McMillan Boldow or Western Forest Products or whoever. And what do they do? They, we went to a council meeting, we say we don't want the trees, it was hundreds and hundreds of people, the biggest turnout they'd ever had. At, North Cowichan District uh, Council, the largest turnout they'd ever had, and the people said, we don't want, we want to stop. We would sign a moratorium, a temporary stoppage. They didn't listen, they went in. Oh, there was a big windstorm in the December. There's lots of uh, deadfall. We have, to cut the, we have to cut that out and bring it in. They clear cut it a whole section of, uh, of Maple Mountain, I believe it was. They didn't wait until the, now we're getting some foresters from UBC who are, ecologically mine. They proved that a forest in Germany makes more money by selective logging and tourism per acre, per hectare. They're like triple the amount that we make by logging, by clear cutting it. Well, and they just looked at the statistics and went, wow, we're going to clear cut anyway. So I don't know what the answers are, but I admire these kids for um, saying you're taking our future away from us, because we are. But um, I don't know, I'm getting preachy now. <laughs> yeah, I'm having a rant. I just have a question. If your sculpture, your um, photo, could speak, what would it be saying? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. I'd say... Maybe it would say silence is a good thing. Maybe we should all practice being quiet a little more. Um, 
instead of ranting. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I would just like to make a, a comment about plastics. One of the most popular plastics for 3D printing, I'm sure you've heard of, is PLA, which is polylactic acid, which is a protein-derived rather than a petroleum-derived substance. And we were just down in the States, and the clear plastic disposable cups at this pizza shop said PLA on the bottom. They would be di biodegradable inherently. Mm. But we had to, we, they said we had biodegradable bags 30, 25 years ago, and what happened to those? You know? They killed off the bacteria. <laughs> no, bacteria can do a lot of things, but I mean, it depends on the... On the well, I'm not a scientist. I don't know any of this stuff. I just say what I, or repeat what I read. It seems to be good ideas, but they, some of them seem to disappear. I remember, you know, Loblaws and Thrifties and everything else was supposed to start using all these biodegradable bags that you could leave in the garden and they would disappear within three or four months, but no, what happened? No, don't. It takes them a long, long time and they're awful, they're awful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would like to know why we had plastic in the first place, because when I was a child, we had nanny wood. Pardon me? It's perfectly all right. We could out of it. <laughs> but then we had to have plastics. Remember the movie, Plastics, is mm -hmm. going to be the, the future, future. Mm -hmm. and it's going to be the end of the world, the way things are going. Mm -hmm. Maybe in the latest matter, you even when you say something along. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to make two comments. Um, one is when you said that Mexico really has a lot of trash on the beach. Well, we would have more trash on the beach. California cleans their beaches early in the morning. Hawaii cleans their beaches. They have machines that come in and sift the sand. If you go before dawn, you don't. You see a lot of things find a lot of things on the beaches. I live in Hawaii half the year. And I walk the beaches sometimes very early in the morning, and that's when you find things. You can still find some of uh, the uh, glass balls. I have had them wash up on the beach. So. But that's a lot more stuff than, than um, Crystal Bay. <laughs> and, the, and the second thing I wanted to say is that um, <clears throat> 30 years ago, I, was able to go across the um, central desert in Australia. And in order to do that, you have to go to the government and get permission to cross the desert. And <clears throat> the reason for that is it's indigenous land. The aboriginals live there. And so you're not supposed to take any pictures or <laughs> speak to the aboriginals or go to their towns or anything like that. But going across the central desert is a very intriguing thing because the aboriginals have, at that point anyway, we're not concerned with many things that were material. And so you would find on uh, the trees were all decorated. <laughs> and they're decorated with clothing and mm. things that they found. <laughs> and they also take bodies of cars that have been abandoned. And they bury them in really interesting ways. <laughs> and and it's, it's a really artistic place. If you ever get a chance to go, it's very, it's very intriguing. I'd love to see that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's dangerous, though, because it's easy to get bogged and die of thirst and things like that. So, so it's, uh, it's, not easy. it's not an easy trip. <laughs> anyway, that's what I'm sure it What kind of trees? Uh, there's a, it's called a live oak. A uh, very, very, very hard piece of wood. Because the, they're very slow. And what time is it? Die, you know, so is it one hour? The and they'll climb up and. I made it. Well. One last thing I was thinking. I'm uh, really intrigued with all your installations and in Seattle we had pigs and I think Vancouver they or Victoria someplace they had fish and I just hope there'll be more installations and maybe ways to foster that on salt frame. Mm. You know, uh, what Shemaitis has those painted murals but maybe more installations on salt frame would add to the 
you know, tourism and any yeah. sense of art and uh, innovation and creativity on the island. So, mm -hmm. well, 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 there should always be more public art, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a tree up to the entrance to Southey Point Drive on that little triangle of land. I don't know if it's still there. It was a really big uh, fir tree there. And every year at Christmas, people would get the, the bags that wine comes in when you buy the shadow to cardboard. And when they empty, you blow them up and they're all shiny. And they have all this kind of recycled <laughs> stuff hanging all over this tree for Christmas. It was so much fun. I, I don't see anyone doing it. Well, I noticed even here on Salt Spring, just going up the road there, yeah. Celia Duthie's place, there's all kinds of outdoor sculpture yeah. there. Yeah. And there's a big, big installation in a field yes. of all those um, yeah. those figures, those they're, they're like totem like figures. Yeah. 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 And there used to be sculptures in the woods behind yeah. Hastings house, yeah. but with that last windstorm we tried to go yeah. through there the other day and there's too many trees down. But yeah. thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for coming. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for coming. Yay.